Today, I begin scratch building a steampunk engine for my shower bank. Welcome all my viewers, especially new ones. Uh, thank you for joining me for another Terranscapes video. I'm Mike and I will be your host today. And you may notice that I changed the intro and I compressed it, made it a little shorter. That seems to be the trend on YouTube. Uh, it seems weird that 15 seconds has now become long. Um, but nevertheless, um, I thought I would try to uh, make the intros to the videos a little bit shorter. So I'm actually moving a lot of the dialogue to the end of the videos now. So I'll just give you a little brief synopsis and then I'll talk about it at the end. I wanted to apologize because YouTube has been flagging some of my videos as having copyright problems and have been putting advertisements in them. Those are not my ads. I, gen I generate no income or revenue from those ads and it annoys me that they're there. So I am working really hard to only use uh, Creative Commons or um, public domain content in my videos going forward. And we'll see if YouTube tries to flag those. I'm very careful, very careful about my music. And if they flag it, I'm gonna fight them on it. But today I'm gonna to show you my plans for the engine and discuss some of the thematic elements I wanna include and then begin to build some of the components for it. So uh, let's jump in and take a look. So for the last uh, two weeks, I have been designing the engine section of the share bank. I wanted to make sure that the engine was functional quote unquote functional. So it would help me in designing it if I thought about how each of the parts actually would function in my imaginary engine. And then it would give me uh, ideas about how to space them or where things should be connected or what kinds of components to add. I wanted it basically to comprise two major components so that there would be a steam component, which is um, the furnace to some degree, and um, a steam tank and a water tank and a circulating system for that, as well as an electrical component, since a lot of steampunk has, uh, you know, sort of semi-sci-fi electrical components, let's call it. So my final decision was to make a furnace and the heat converts a special ore into electricity. Uh, this ore generates electricity when it's heated. It goes to these uh, sort of transformers, which goes to this sort of transformer, and then into an electrical motor, and the electrical motor is what drives the gears primarily. Now, the steam component comes in with the cooling system. So I have a steam tank here and a water tower here, water tank. And the water tank is primarily, this system is primarily designed to cool the electrical motor, uh, but also provides some cooling for the furnace. In my mind, the ore that is uh, being burned, it's a special ore that is steampunk ore, it generates heat and burns for a very long time, uh, but the ore that is on top that is generating electricity, the amount of electricity it generates is determined by the temperatures involved, and so the cooling system can also lower the temperature of the uh, furnace as needed to regulate some of the power supply. Mm, it's a little, little wishy-washy squishy there, but uh, you get the idea. So there's also a water pipe underneath here that's not shown that runs to here and then another outlet here uh, that produces, uh, when it produces steam, goes back into the steam tank, which runs into the back of the wall here. And then um, there's a large gear set here that acts as a condenser and that uh, condenses it back to water to return to the water tank here. Now, the last thing I added, which I felt very strong about, was to have a clear area where a mini could stand a person operating this vehicle so that they could control various, you know, micro adjustments on any of these components to start up the engine and to give me an opportunity to add some really nice controls and gauges and, and other little small details that sort of bring this area to life quite a bit, I think. In a rare designing benefit, uh, I could actually design this at one-to-one -one scale. And so here would be potentially my uh, operator for the back. And so this allows me to precisely measure each of the elements in here so that I can build it exactly as it's shown. And the reason why 
I need it to be precise is because I wanted to cram in as much as I could into the overall uh, engine area. I want it to look very busy. Uh, and so having lots of things pressed up against each other, places to run, you know, hoses and cables and, and to fit in, you know, the gears. And my general plan as it stands right now has all of these elements measured to the 32nd. And I have a little leeway that I've uh, built in that's um, about a 16th of an inch. And I wanted to have the width uh, be two and a quarter inches. My original design was wider and the model, the sort of maquette that I uh, created earlier is actually a little bit wider as well. I think it's uh, two and a half here. So I wanted to shrink it because I have plenty of space up top for uh, as many minis across as I really want. So this could be narrower very easily. And that meant that I needed to shrink the engine component as, as much as I could. The third component that any good steampunk design needs to include is clockwork and gears. And I suddenly got inspired. It occurred to me that I could get some watch movements and use those. Now, one of the things that it struck me when I got these is that it'd be wonderful to just use them as they are. Already, they have all the gearing put in place exactly. It's, it's actually a functional arrangement and some interesting kind of uh, coverings over some of the gears shape-wise. And so it made me think that I could incorporate some of these actually all encased as it is right into the vehicle's design. Problem with that is that uh, painting some of these, you know, because of course everything would need to be painted to look appropriate for the model, painting some of these gears that are in the far back is going to be a little bit tricky. So I do plan on disassembling these to be able to paint them. I actually have a large bag of partially complete watch movements and I've already taken apart one to kind of get a sense of how that all works and how easy it might be to put things back together. But for instance, um, this gear would be sitting in the back as the uh, condenser and then uh, this gear would be on the side here to drive the wheels and then this gear, uh, this watch I should say, movement would be something like this or possibly like this but I think I have to shorten it and so it probably will go somehow in the side. The uh, other challenge that I have before me is to actually make them look a little different. If I have, you know, three watches that look like this, just like that, right? You're going to see these this repetitive pattern as all watches share some structural features. So um, some of these sections will be covered and uh, some will be you know, putting on like a crank handle or something so that you could manually adjust it, that kind of idea. The other thing I picked up were some larger gears and uh, I really wanted to have a larger gear to drive the uh, the wheel itself. And you can see here a little bit of that design uh, to have a larger gear and then it drives a smaller gear and that that is somehow incorporated into the uh, watch movement that is behind here. And it's important to me that the gearing actually functions. You know me from the orc board project and the winch that I built. Uh, I would like it to be actually functional if it were able to be operated or at least hide spots that are not functional so that you can't determine whether it would actually work or not. Uh, but what's nice about this is I've been able to get some gears that actually uh, fit teeth wise very well so that it will actually look appropriate and amongst the watch movements there are some gears of course there's gears that match up uh, this would be like the control panel facing here so like a master electrical switch some dials and gauges I have a lot to say about dials and gauges coming up so uh, don't um, don't offer too many suggestions just yet because I have some brass etch pieces coming and, um, you know, open sections for other clockwork. And so I would like to incorporate, you know, small gearings in a couple spots. I have a ridiculous amount of gears now, a ridiculous amount and watch movements. So this stuff has to get put in here somehow. Last thought uh, was that um, the motor section here has a, uh, I thought, might be nice to add a sort of Van de Graaff generator type top piece that would go onto it. So that's what this kind of represents. I have been looking through all of my various electronics 
and and beads and and all sorts of stuff. Even ordered a couple fancy shaped light bulbs just so I'd have options. And I thought for no particular reason at all that I would start with these units as they seem kind of uh, small and easy to focus on. I'm going to build those using a capacitor as the foundation. This is, for those of you who might be interested, 10 volt, 100 microfarad or farad uh, capacitor. And stripping off the insulation, they look like this. And I thought that was kind of a nice size, just to give you a little scale, right? That's a nice little size for that piece. So uh, I am going to strip that off. And I have been doing that with a Zacto blade. wire clippers do not cut these flush and realize there's a little hole it's a little bit wider than the wire itself I guess I'm gonna have to fill that I'm gonna use a uh, squadron green putty to fill the tops uh, I never thought I would use this as much as I have been uh, it dries so fast, it's just a really quick and easy way to fill things, and it sands pretty well. So that's a nice bonus. All right, I'm going to set those aside for a second to dry. And the next thing I want to work on are the uh, little top balls that go on these pieces. Oh boy. And I have a ton of these little tiny pieces, but man, they are hard to fish out. I need to drill a little hole so I can effectively pin them to that post and Holding them steady obviously seems like a bit of a chore. And I found that if I use my circle template, I can kind of pin them in place. That seems to hold them pretty well. Excuse me while I mark it with a Zacto. And the hole doesn't need to be terribly big. Just enough to give me a little spot for the post to fit. Uh, I think, uh, I gotta check, I think this is a 132nd drill bit. Uh, so that will be the post size. We'll check that in a second. Might be a 0.03. I have a jig. I have a jig for this. So, let's see here. I guess I'd like it to fill it a little bit heavy, just so I don't have to try to fill a gap. Uh-oh, uh-oh, get off of there. Jesus. Okay. So I'm dipping it with into the Zacto blade, not the best system. All right, that's not too bad. The beads are, they're not exactly uh, formed, you know, they're mass produced by the thousands in a crappy machine. So I already expected that I would have to do a little, a little sanding on the edges. Uh, I think I have brass rod that will fit it, and so then I can glue it to it, and I can gently sand it smooth. That one is not as centered as the other. I 
is, this is okay. This metal, it must be like aluminum or something. Very, very soft. And uh, that's getting a nice, that's getting a nice rounded edge. Shiner, uh, 1,000, 4,000. I guess I'm, I'm not gonna need the uh, silicon carbide. This is so soft that uh, I think I'm just gonna get a good, a good effect. One of my things that I was a little bit curious about though is how the, how smooth the squadron will come out. And um, oh, look at that. Look at that. It's more polished than the rest of it. That came out very nicely. The squadron looks pretty good on top as well. I like this template as a jig to give me a little extra support on these. But the squadron is a little bit brittle. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Shit. Well, I should have just put it in fractions of inches. Uh, not fractions, but decimal places of inches. When I do that, I get... That's pretty, oh, that's a thread. I get a 0.0385, now the closest I have, which is funny because I have a lot of sizes of styrene, not so many in brass and aluminum, but I do have a few. This is 0.032, so it's a little bit thinner. That's the best I've got. Let's see here, in my sketch, oh, look at that, I've added a little base plate. That's a good idea. All right, I'm gonna cut that out in a second. Oh, I have to drill through that. Oh, that would have been, e oh, that hides the, that's a good thing, okay. So I hope you enjoyed uh, seeing the plans and what I have in store and a little bit of the early construction. Uh, I have shot several videos already and uh, those are getting edited and getting lined up for future releases. I would say that this is a series, uh, but uh, it's an open-ended series as there will probably be quite a few videos uh, related to the engine build. Um, it was uh, a challenging video to edit because I've never worked with so much footage at once before. I had six and a half hours of footage, compress it down to an hour and a half, split that up into different videos. And uh, that was uh, something that my computer wasn't happy about and Premiere Pro wasn't happy about, a bug emerged that I've never seen before. And I don't think I was happy about because I really was burnt out after doing that editing. And uh, I'm gonna try and break those up a little bit more, uh, but I have plenty of videos is lined up for regular releases, so uh, expect regular content from me for quite a while. And one more thought about the series, open-ended series, is that each video is, as I'm editing it, I'm noticing that each video is introducing maybe a different uh, um, technique or a different tool or uh, different um, materials. So, you know, I don't want you to think like, oh God, you know, it's gonna be, you know, I can, I don't wanna see part two or part three or part four because it's gonna be more of the same. Um, it's, they're definitely different and unique, which actually made me feel good about it because I was like, oh, there's more to share and more to offer. So that's just a little heads up on them. So with all of that, I should wrap it up. Uh, questions and comments are always welcome down below. I'm behind on them, again. See them ellipses afterwards. But I am gonna sit down as this video uploads, I'm gonna start cranking through them uh, because I wanna keep up on them. Sometimes you guys offer super helpful tips. So I need to watch the, uh, I need to read the comments and I'm working on putting together the next cocktails and comments video as well. So uh, I'm inspired and, uh, and, uh, and motivated. And if you like this uh, content and you wanna support my project and this channel and me, I could use some support right now. Uh, you can become a patron, and that also offers you uh, some opportunities for alternative uh, content. Check out Patreon, see some of the rewards that are over there, and 
read some of my public posts and you can get a sense of the kinds of content that I'm offering there. So next video, I'm gonna finish up my little converters and I think I start building the walls of the firebox, which is the next section I'll be building. So hopefully you'll come back to see those sections get built because you know that I will be back soon with another Terrence Scapes video.